Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVM LP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online WPVMFM.org. The voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com. For more on Walter's music, Thank you, Devine Dio, for managing WPVM FM in Asheville, and Robin Collier for managing KCEI in Taos, New Mexico. If you'd like to reach out to me, Nave at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N A V E. I'd like to invite you to a Zoom performance of A Child's Christmas in Wales. I'm recording this on December the 14th. On December the 20th, after this show airs in Taos and in Asheville, I will be performing A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas on Zoom. So if you would like to join me for that performance, no matter where you are in the world, you can find the Zoom link at my website, jamesnave.com. Just below the fold, you'll see the link to the events page, or you can email me, nave at jamesnave.com, and I'll be glad to send you the Zoom link. I look forward to seeing you on the call. We'll do a little celebration and a bit of a salon conversation. Today, I have a new friend on, Georgina Haynes, and she goes by George. A few weeks ago, my next door neighbor, Janet, and I were walking down the the road out in front of our house. It's called La Canada Road. And we ran into two people, had a couple of dogs. They were just walking along, enjoying the sun, and it was on Thanksgiving. And the introduction that we made was, well, are you, are you blowing off a bit of steam from your Thanksgiving dinner? And then we started to talk and I met Shannon and then met George. I'm going to call her George because that's what she likes. And I, we said, where are you from? We're from Portland. And we said, wow, well, what are you doing here? We're on vacation. Well, why are you here? Well, we're just relaxing because in Portland, we work as puppeteers. We make puppets. And we also learned standing there on La Canada Road that George was the head of the studio or the shop that made all of the puppets for Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. And Shannon was one of the people who helped her do that. And that movie won an Academy Award. So when we learned that, we were even more curious about what it means to be a puppeteer. But what we learned most about George and Shannon is they both love to tell stories and talk. And George (laughs) really loves to talk and tell stories. So, George, we don't know where this will go, but welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio. It's great to be here. And it was such a great moment meeting you both. Well, it was our pleasure, too. And then we went on to have a meal. And then the next <laughs> night we had another meal. It was it was really, 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 really great fun. And then you and Shannon drove back up to Portland. And now you're in Portland and I'm in Taos. You're under yeah. a great deal of weather and I'm under the sun. So <laughs> I know that you are a creative person. You do creative work for a living. And yeah. I would like for you to reflect on how... When you engage in the creative work you do, how does it feed you? How does it inform you? How does it give you that spirit to encounter us on the rim road and say, hi, are you blowing off steam from your Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's an interesting world that I'm involved in because it's the world of stop motion animation, which is essentially making three-dimensional puppets that are articulated frame by frame and brought to life by animators. So it's an art form that uses engineering, that uses creativity, but it also uses a lot of people. I'm a bit of an odd artist in that I have an eye for design and style, but I also have this engineering side to my brain. And then I'm also a people person. So combining all of those energies into my every day, that's what feeds my creative soul. My creative soul, it definitely needs the aesthetic side of creativity. I, I love to see beautiful things and I love to realize things with the skills that I have at my fingertips. But then Also, bringing a team of other artists together from all different disciplines and working together with them 
successfully and making some that then can come to life and tell a story, that fills the soul. To work on one of these puppets, sometimes it's at least 30, if not 40 individual people that are involved with each element of it. So when that all comes together and it actually all fits and the puppet works, not only is it a sigh of relief, it's that energy that feeds many levels of my soul, the creative level, the engineering, engineering and creativity are so closely related anyway. Science and art, it's that sort of conversation, isn't it? Well, how do you keep the airplane in the sky? How do you keep the bridge up when the cars drive across it? How do you figure out how to make a beautiful highway so that it curves properly down into the valley or whatever? All of that's that creative engineering. When we met, I hadn't seen the movie that you worked on, Pinocchio, and you ran the entire program around the the puppet making. Now, and I did watch it the day that we met, and I had been meaning to watch it, and it was a terrific movie. Wonderful, wonderful film. When you were making those images and working with them, did you find you talked to them, and as you developed them, did they take on an imaginary life in your own sensibilities? It's a really interesting question because, you know, our part of it, my part of it, is literally making the characters. So we're not bringing them to life. We're not animating the characters. We're making them. It's interesting to think of the back and forth. When we complete a character, an inanimate sculpture, it has costume and hair and flesh and an internal skeleton, but it's really inanimate. So we are proud of this object, but then it takes on a whole new life and persona when the animator steps onto a stage with it and moves it frame by frame. And we see the film footage come back at us maybe three weeks later. So that moment definitely feeds the creative soul and feeds the want to give more as well. When you're working on a movie like this, you're not just making one puppet of one character. We made over 250 puppets to to shoot the movie, some of which were duplicates. So Pinocchio himself, because the movie is all about Pinocchio, we made over 25 Pinocchio puppets. People often ask me, how long does it take to make a puppet for a movie like this? My answer to them is, from the first day of the puppet build until the last day of the film shoot. Going back to your question, each time we see a puppet performing, we've got this perfectionist eye that we want to make it better for its next performance. And we're literally tweaking and making that sculpture able to perform better and better throughout the movie. One of the most frustrating things in our jobs is that we often have to make the hero character for one of our films as the first puppet build. So you're establishing the techniques, the look, the engineering level in that hero puppet, which is the first thing you're doing. So often you make all the mistakes on that first character and you have to live with them all the way you know, for the next year, year and a half. But what it is doing is informing how you're going to make the next one and how you're going to make the next one. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether that really answers your question, but I think it touches on it. It gives me some insight. And what I'm thinking now is when I think of puppets until I met you, I've not given puppets that much thought. I've known a few people who make puppets. A fellow named Hobie Ford in Nashville, North Carolina has been a puppeteer all his life and he makes beautiful beautiful puppets and yet when they're finished that's it they come to life because he does a show with his puppets Mm -hmm. i didn't have the frame that you now have given me thinking you start with the puppet and then the puppet builds and corrects and builds and it's a full ebb and flow evolution of this image that you're working with so you wouldn't just have the stuffed bear that you talk to at night before you go to sleep. This puppet is moving around inside the imaginations of 70 people or Mm -hmm. how many ever you have working on the show. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, to make a stop motion feature film, there's usually up to 300, 400 people involved from the initial writing of it to the storyboarding of it 
then the design aspect, it's not just designing the characters, the puppets, it's also designing the environment. Then I'm part of the puppet fabrication team, but there's also the environment fabrication team. And then there's the stage team. You've got camera, lighting, all of the people that need to bring our worlds to life with light. And then the animators come in to animate all of this in the environment. And then when all those shots are coming off the stages, they're going through an editorial department that are cutting it all together and and turning it back into the script that you've started with. And then we also have a visual effects department to get things that you just can't do by hand and in stop motion. So skies and water, rain and things like that. So when does the voiceover actor come yeah. in to play in this sequence of development? That's a very, very important question for stop motion. We have to record all of the voiceovers at the beginning before any of the shooting is done. So we are usually recording the voices at the same time that we're building the puppets. What happens with the voice tracks is that once they're recorded, they are broken down into sheets the animator can work with in all of the mouth shapes that need to talk the words that the actors have spoken. The other reason it's really important to do the voiceovers beforehand is often the characters of the puppets that are being played by certain actors The animators will take on some of the mannerisms of the actors and put them into the puppets. So we will video record all of the voice recordings at the beginning as well. And what's really uncanny is that you can start off designing a puppet, not knowing who's going to be the voiceover for it. And then suddenly, when your puppet is coming to completion and everybody knows who's doing the voiceover for that character, they meld. They meld. One will influence another. And <laughs> so the actors come to the table aware of the story, aware yeah. of the characters. They've done all the same development. They would evolve on a movie shoot, and yet they're playing the scenes that are in the script. So the actors bring their creative intuition to bear setting the tone for everything else that comes after. Is that what I'm hearing? The initial story is translated into a screenplay. Sometimes they record individual actors without the other actors in the same place. Sometimes they will bring two of the actors into the same room and have them play out against each other. It really depends on actor availability. Um, But the director is always there. The director is directing the actors. It's like a radio play. The director is directing a radio play, but then that play doesn't just stick as a radio play. Then it's translated into frame-by-frame movement with puppets. So when I watched Pinocchio, I was not even aware I was watching puppets. I was watching characters just like I would be watching the actors who played the voiceover for these characters. When I was watching it, I could see how complicated it was. Why would you carry a piece of art into that arena? I know it's art. It was beautiful. It won an Academy Award. It was great. And I could see why it was worth all the effort. But what's the motivation for that? Why not just make a movie with the actors? We ask ourselves that sometimes, time and time again. But I think what stop motion does, it, it brings a magic into reality. Number one, you can't bring a wooden puppet to life in reality. You can put strings on it and you can have a marionette, but you can't bring a wooden boy to life. They don't exist. So that's the joy of stop motion animation. You can bring any inanimate object to life through stop motion. So stop motion and animation in general has existed since film began. 24 images make one second of film. So the minute that people were aware of that, You can either literally take the celluloid film and scratch onto it 24 images and bring that to life, or you can put the celluloid film in a film camera and click 24 times, focusing that film camera on either a drawn sheet of paper with drawings or 
into a three-dimensional world of three-dimensional characters. And it can be as simple as moving a stone across a table and bringing a pebble to life frame by frame. Basically, you can bring anything to life in animation. That's why you do it in animation as opposed to live action. But why do we do it? handmade frame by frame when we've got computers out there that can emulate all of this well the human eye thank goodness and the human brain still relates to handmade organic real objects more than it relates to the perfection of computers (laughs) and you shot this with film right or did you Um, shoot with digital we, we shot digital that jump to digital in the filmmaking aspect of it has really helped. That's the reason that stop motion animation, the performance is so much better now than it was, say, 100 years ago. Because this tool you can see the previous frame, you can see three frames previous to you on a computer screen before you move your puppet to get the next frame. So we now have artificial intelligence. What you just told me, the human eye, the handmade object. One thing artificial intelligence will never have, it will never have human hands born from a mother. Absolutely. Never. Never. And it will never have those imperfections that only things from nature, humans being part of that, have we're organic matter (laughs) and i think the most important part about that makes each of us an individual is the mistakes is the fact that we're not symmetrical that's what makes everything interesting and that's what i think the reason that an audience is drawn to something like stop motion as opposed to a computer animated film it's all those little mistakes well you brought up something so important which is perfectionism. When you and Shannon were here, we had our nice visit and Shannon, your collaborator in work, was talking about how she was driven by perfectionism. Perfectionism this, perfectionism that. And yet what you're telling me, the only way to achieve art in the arena that you and Shannon work in, you have to make the mistakes. That's what distinguishes it. Could you reflect on that contrast, perfectionism and the mistakes you make? And where does that intersection take place? When does it meet or does it? I don't think it meets because I don't think we're aware of the imperfection in the art that we're involved in. We're striving to copy what we're looking at to a perfect level. When we're watching a live action film with actors, what endears us to a character it will usually be an imperfection of that character because we can relate. I'm a perfectionist to a certain level. I can see the bigger picture of what level of perfection all of these millions of things that we're making have to be. I'm also thinking if perfection is the ideal, and you just said the imperfections, the mistakes are what make the art happen, why would we call a mistake a mistake when we can call a mistake beauty? Absolutely. I agree. And you know, you can never achieve perfection, but what if you could achieve perfection and you got it all perfect without mistakes, without flaws, what would happen then? Yeah, it would be really boring. It's all in the language, isn't it? It's in the words that are used, the positive or negative. Use the words that we've been trained to use. Oh, absolutely. Without stopping to think, hmm, wait a minute. Am I actually describing this in the way that is accurate? And that's a very interesting thing to bring up with someone like me. I always struggled with the English language. And I, to this day, don't know whether it was dyslexia or an attention deficit disorder. But basically, at times, not being able to find the right word to describe properly and having this absolute cloud over me when I was a young kid at school feeling that I was stupid because I never had the right word the teacher wanted to hear for that moment. And yet that's not what life's about. That <laughs> there's, there's never a right and a wrong word to be used in a moment. There's many words. 
I'm thinking again about Pinocchio, the little boy, beautiful little boy who came after the, the what was Pinocchio's father's name? Geppetto. Geppetto, after his son died, then Pinocchio came from that. And now you're talking about growing up. You're talking about being in school. You're talking about feeling stupid because you didn't have the words around you. And I flashed on you as little Pinocchio uh, in the right. school <laughs> trying to figure out how to work around all of these things. Pinocchio wobbled around and you were wobbling around. Could you describe a bit of what your younger school years were like? Because I know you grew up in the UK so yeah. you would have a different experience maybe than some of the listeners on this show in terms of their experience in the early years of their educations. In England, for me growing up, the most important things to learn off the bat were reading and writing and maths. So I was always okay with maths, but I was terrible at reading and writing. And a lot of it was to do with my attention. You know, I was way more interested in the, the visual thing over there than sitting down and reading these printed words on a paper and trying to read out these printed words on a paper was really hard for me. And I don't think any of my teachers went out to make me feel this way, but I felt stupid from an early age of that I wasn't intelligent. I, I, I had a big hang up throughout my early education that I was not intelligent because intelligence was being good at reading and writing. When did you realize you were intelligent? What motivated that? What sparked that? I think age. I think being in the world. It was after I'd left school. I'm in my 50s now and it was probably in my 30s. I had a, a, a moment of like, oh, maybe as stupid as I've always thought I was. And, <laughs> and actually ending up doing a lot of public speaking, which when I was at school, I would never have imagined because I would basically, well, I can't get on stage because I don't have the vocabulary to get on stage. But the way I have ended up doing public speaking is just talking from the heart. I'm just explaining what I do, but with an excitement and a passion because I love what I do. And I think the reason that I survived school is I had a family that my parents were incredibly supportive and they didn't push it down my throat that I couldn't read and write. When the teacher sent me home with an old cigar tin of words because I couldn't remember how to read after a summer vacation because I'd had too much fun. They sent me home with and and it and on, all these really simple words, and I had to, my homework was to memorise them. And that, to me, was the most demoralising thing that's ever happened to me. And that lived with me right the way through my 30s. But my parents, they were like, you've been on summer holiday. That happens. We forget things. And look at the wonderful soft toys you made over that summer so they encouraged because they knew I was really good with my hand eye coordination I mean my dad joked he said I've never seen a kid like it pick up a pair of scissors when you were three years old and you could cut a straight line he said I still can't cut a straight line in a piece of paper <laughs> so they just saw something in me and it's funny because my mum was a physics teacher my dad was an electrical engineer, and you would think that my mum being in the teaching world might try and push me more to conform, but they actually really liked the fact that I didn't conform. That's, I think, how I kept my head above water in the British education system. And that, and I'm not saying it's a bad system, because I do think that the British education system is a lot more focused for kids than maybe the American. Now I'm learning in the 17 years of being here, what the education system, especially higher education, when you're going off to college, it's so unfocused here. Whereas I was able to decide, right, well, I'm going to go to college and I want to make puppets. So what course best applies for making puppets? That one there, I'll go there. And I made puppets and I learned how to make puppets for stop motion. So I was really able to focus in that system once I found who I was and what I was good at. 
So now in your studio in Portland, you have many people you're supervising and working with. You have young people who are emerging from college showing up on your doorstep or in your studio. What kind of dynamics do you experience between the generation you're representing and the Gen Z generation? How do the generations inform each other in terms of the development, the cross-pollination? That's a really interesting question. With every year that passes, it's becoming more and more complex of the generations coming together. And I mean, I was taught, again, by my family from a really early age, we're all humans and treat everybody with respect and everybody brings something to the table. And that's how I've always tried to be a boss, not dictating to people how it should be, listening, working as a team, taking on people's ideas, but also being able to say no when things are getting too maybe sort of this way or that way. But from a sort of a human aspect, really appreciating the diversity. And I mean, it's very interesting with stop motion. We're an odd little industry. We all know each other, but we call ourselves a roving band of, you know, gypsies traveling around the world, working on projects. There has never been that many stop motion projects going on. So that's why we all kind of know each other. And it gives a place for a lot of creative kids coming out of schools and colleges who are really a little lost. Often they find stop motion. And I'm not completely sure why stop motion attracts kids that need to find a way in life. It's very accepting. And it's not just my team. Most of the other teams I know in stop motion are very accepting. Um, And often the stories that we tell in stop motion can be a bit braver than some of the stories that are told in these brightly coloured computer, big studio films. Yeah. I don't know why that's happened. We could make feature films in bright colours with ball-type characters and simple, fluffy stories. Instead, we have directors like Tim Burton and Guillermo del Toro and Wes Anderson that are drawn to our medium and our art form because they can tell more interesting stories to a wider age range. So a lot of the stop motion films that are made attract adults and kids. I am always amazed. I worked on the film Coraline and it was the first feature that I worked on when I came to America at Leica. I am amazed how many kids that now come to work for me as adults, their life was formed by that film. Kids, when they watched it, they were having one struggle or another at home or at school, not feeling like they fitted in. And that film gave them a place that they could relate to that character. And often it's for young girls, because Coraline was a young girl. They've idolised this character in their lives. It's like, this is the reason I, I went to see Coraline and it changed my life. It's like, Wow. <laughs> I wonder if because we are so steeped in the digital space and the younger people grow up with all the devices in hand and they're quite skilled with that, I wonder if they're drawn to the timelessness of the old-fashioned shop, the vinyl aspect. I refer to the vinyl aspects of things. Yeah. Black and white (laughs) photography, the vinyl records in the shop dust floating around, little images that you have to touch. There's Mm -hmm. a timelessness about that. It may remind anyone who enters the arena of the long tradition of humanity just holding the stick over the fire, perhaps. What do you think? It goes back to that, why do people go and watch stop motion? Because there is a tangibility to what they're seeing on and a relatability that is a real object in a real space i am a real object in a real space and that has flaws and so do i <laughs> i am a real object in a real space i belong pinocchio was about home yeah where do you belong and then finally pinocchio goes off on his grand adventure 
But as he enters the grand adventure, he's leaving into the grand home of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I do think that that is subconsciously what the younger people are are being drawn to with the films that we make. And how about the older ones, the elder ones? You're in the position of the elder. How does it affect you? And I use that term elder in the best sense of creative leadership. We can set tones. People look to us and we can be generous. Our open heart. Hey, come be part of the fire. How does this affect you? I think when I see a film like Pinocchio and it's very hard to step out of having been involved in that film for so many years, but to try and watch it as a piece of entertainment or a story, it has such a heartfelt message, which I feel Guillermo del Toro does that in all of his storytelling in his movies. You know, when when I saw Shape of Water, the year that he released Shape of Water was the year that Me Too, Black Lives Matter, LBGT, it was all hitting the world stage. I'm a member of the Academy, so I have to vote each year on on all these films. And that was such a heavy year of film watching. Everything had a very hard-hitting, in-your-face message. And yet Guillermo comes along with a film about a sea monster falling in love with a young woman in a town. And he touched on everything that all of these different communities were struggling with, but he touched on it and told it in the heart of a fairy tale. So there was an element of escapism while you're dealing with the reality of all of the issues that are in your face every day. And that it's the magic of Guillermo, and that's the magic of what he did with Pinocchio as well. He tells a story of family and relationships in family and how hard it can be to understand each other and to feel accepted and, and to be accepted for who you are. He's doing all of this through the eyes of a wooden boy <laughs> being carved by a father who's had trauma. Geppetto has gone through a lot of trauma. You know that he's lost his son, but where's his wife in all of this? Is what you know that there's so much sort of trauma he's been through, and yet he finds love. It, it, he struggles, but he finds love of this wooden boy that he's accidentally created. It strikes me that Guillermo must have a deep relationship with his boy inside of him. And yet that relationship must also take its cues from the full grown, mature artist he now is. Do you see the little boy dancing with the mature artist when you work with him? Yes, all the time. He will be intensely serious about something. And then this little scampy little kid will come in and, and it'll and then you're like, uh oh, the twinkles in his eye is gonna cause mayhem anyway. What's he gonna say? So yes, he's always dancing between those worlds. I wonder if that's something we all could acquire or we all could connect with. Maybe he got lucky, he connected with that early on and was able to continue with it. I know a lot of people who fall short of that levity, that festiveness that the boy brings or the girl brings or the the little one brings, the little elf or whatever it is. I do wonder whether a lot of it is to do with his culture, being born and brought up in Mexico. It's very, it's, there's such strong family ties. They have a very different perception on life and death to the world that I grew up in. So I think that grounding, I mean, he has got such an immense knowledge of art and storytelling and filmmaking. He never fails to amaze me. I mean, that was the road he was going <laughs> to, his whole life is what he does. He's so passionate about it. It all combines. And his foundation, you know, he got into the film industry through effect. He made like prosthetics for people and he got his hands dirty at the beginning and worked his way up through through the ranks. He's got the fairy tale story. So you, the artist working in this, how much have you allowed yourself to wallow in the fanciful 
notions of childhood while still being the adult? Ooh, I think I do allow myself to do that every day just because of this world that I'm in. I feel like I come to sort of like a playgroup most days. <laughs> I'm doing what comes naturally to me when I come to work. I'm enjoying what I do. I can pick up a piece of clay. I can stitch a piece of fabric. There's a lot of laughter in our workshop. There's a lot of laughter. We tell stories. We There's a lot of sharing. We know each other too well. <laughs> Moving away from your shop and the work, you told me when you were here how you are lucky to have a collective that you work with and uh, participate in and collaborate with outside of your work in Portland. It's a dynamic group of people. As we move close to the end of our time together, I'd love for you to reflect on that, how you bring your artistic sensibilities from the workplace, the joy into the Portland community you're so involved in? One of the most important things that feeds my creative soul is the great outdoors. Interestingly, in the world I'm involved in, it's not, a lot of my colleagues don't see the importance of that. And, and that is what feeds every day my creative soul. So I was always searching for a bolt hole outside of the city in an open space where my soul could breathe. And through music um, and through musicians, I was invited to become a part of this intentional community that was set up in the 1970s. And they sought me. They came out and found me. And in and after testing me out for a few years of like getting to know me, and we parted and we went to a lot of musical events and we talked until two in the morning about life and what was important. And one day, my fr my good friend Paul, who had from seventeen years old lived on in this community, um, he's now in his seventies. He basically reached out and said, "I would love for you to become a member." So I went and visited the the place, and it's a plot of land outside of Portland, up a hill, <laughs> in the forest. It's interesting because the first time you visit this place, you have to give to this place to receive. And, you know, the first time I visited, I'm like, well, it, it, it's interesting. And, you know, you can tell that people have lived here in the past, but it's, it's kind of bit shabby around the edges and there's you know there's a lot of junk over there and there's a lot of this over here but there's a beautiful meadow over there but anyway I joined because I couldn't not all my friends were a part of it and it's been a magical experience for me because the more time I have spent in this place which has become an incredibly special place with these people it the more the amazing experience that the place gives back to me. Every time I go, something magical happens. I see something, I meet somebody, I hear some fabulous music. It's just a very interesting experience of spending time with a group out in one very small part of the countryside um, and experiencing what comes and goes from that. Do you just drop in and informally things happen or do you plan things or do people live there how does that work and how many people do you have so all of the above there are only two family groups that live there permanently so a couple and their newborn and then a single mother and her teenage daughter and then there are nine of us that are members there are about Half of those that are the original members from the 70s who have got their own lives now. And some do more with the community than others. Some are just sort of, you know, looking on and happy that it's still a thriving community, but don't want to be active in it, but are still members. And then myself, because of the work I do, I have to be in the city during the week. But most weekends and through lockdown, I was able to spend a lot of time up there and I've invested a lot of my time and energy, creative energy into one of the buildings up there. And with the help of others, we've renovated one of the buildings, which then sparked 
another person's idea to build a tree house and another person to renovate. So it's very accumulative. But yeah, we 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 drop in and we drop out. And some years I've been a member now for about seven years. And some years I'm up there every single weekend and every vacation. But then other years, it was interesting. My trip to New Mexico, where I met you, was partly because I hadn't done anything like that for so long because I've always been going up to Mist. It's called Mist Mountain Farm. And as beautiful as it is, I needed I needed a different great outdoors to re-stimulate and I needed to meet new people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Janet and I, it seems, had the opportunity to join you in your property in Portland, even though we were here, because I had a fantastic time when we met. And I'm thinking now, well, if that's what they do up there, no so, wonder she goes every weekend. <laughs> it is. We we cook great shepherd's pies. We drink wine. We talk. Yeah, everybody brings something to the table. So as we close out, I know you've taken the time from your, your, for your lunch hour to be with us here. It seems like you're an artist who thrives in a large, beautiful garden of multi-purpose flowers. And if you were alone in the desert as a rock sitting under the sun, probably wouldn't be so much fun, would it? Absolutely. You got me. You, you, <laughs> you, you've definitely seen into my soul and seen how I thrive. Definitely. And, and it's interesting. I crave, I wish there was a part of me that could be that rock in the desert, but it's not who I am. I, yeah, I love to be surrounded by people and constantly changing flowers as well. Well, George, thank you for bringing some of your flowery world to Twice Five Miles Radio. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been great chatting and as always, in the, <laughs> we've only known each other a short time, but it's very inspiring. Well, we'll do more. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. And there you go, my friends. Thus concludes my conversation with Georgina Haynes. And as you already know, her friends call her George. And I also hope you now have a better sense of what it takes to create a piece of collaborative art. And if you've ever participated in a collaboration like George was talking about, you know how good it feels when you're working with a group of people putting rough elements together into something beautiful, like the movie Pinocchio, which you can view on Netflix. Pinocchio is a universal story about a man who loses his son in war, goes through deep grief, and tries to rebuild his life by constructing a little boy out of wood and the little boy has a nose and every time the little boy tells a lie his nose grows and in Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio the nose plays a big role in how the boy evolves and finally becomes a young man leaving his home and going out into the world and the best part of storytelling you don't have to be a filmmaker to create a good story. You have plenty of stories you can tell based on the life that you've lived up to this point. You can tell them around a table, you can tell them to a friend, you can tell them to a small audience, or you can just think about them and write them down and tell them to yourself. And speaking of storytelling, last night I attended a gathering on Zoom that happens once a month. It's a gathering associated with the New Mexico Storytelling Association. That's a bit of a workshop, a bit of a conversation, somewhat salon-like, and storytelling. And after each person tells their story, folks on the call say what they like about it, how they think it could be improved. It's a really a great little workshop. People don't come fully prepared. They bring their stories in hopes of workshopping them, which is exactly what happens. I usually come with a spine of an idea, something that I would like to develop as a true story told from my own life. I often have just a bit of a seed that starts at the beginning of the session and it grows throughout the time and I finally volunteer to tell a story. Last night our theme was peace and light since we're almost to the longest night of the year in the northern hemisphere. So I told a true life story about transformation, peace and the light that comes from one person's face when something good happens to them. I usually record the story just in case I hit the mark. Last night? I did a pretty good job, and I was glad that I recorded the story. So what I would like to do now to finish out our time together, I would just like to play the story for you. So here it is. It doesn't have a title. That will come later. 
In 1970, I hitchhiked to Denver, Colorado to visit a friend of mine who was driving up from Mexico. And we met in Denver. And I went out there because I longed to go find something. You know, you go on the journey, you find something. And I didn't know what I was looking for. I was worried, though, when I hitchhiked to Denver because I had a draft number of 52. And for those of you who can count, you know there are 365 days in a year. And if your draft number is 52 in the draft back then, that meant that I was one of the first to be called up. I was headed to Vietnam. I was going to fight. I was frustrated because I didn't want to go as an, as an enlisted personnel. I wanted to go and be a general. I thought I would be well suited as a general, but I just didn't quite have the chops for that. But I was worried because I was on the verge of being drafted and I was 20 years old. Got out to Denver and my buddy and I met, rip-roaring time as you would have if you were in your 20s, as you all remember. I went into an Army-Navy store, went to the back of the Army-Navy store. I was worried because I'd flunked out of a junior college. I had no options except to get drafted or go to Canada. So I walked into that Army-Navy store and I, it was dusty and musty and yicky smelling. And I went to the back and there was a box of bayonets. And I opened the box of bayonets, picked one up and held it in my hand and stabbed the air with it. And as I stabbed the air, I imagined it going into the guts of another soldier, holding the soldier up on the bayonet. And it was absolutely the worst imaginative feeling I could have had. I thought, I can't do this. I cannot do it. I can't do it. So I put that greasy bayonet back in its box and I closed the box. My buddy and I had a day or so, and then I hitchhiked back to North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina, 12 Pine Lane, the house my father built in 1953, the house I lived in, the house where I'd played Appalachian music with my father, and the house where my father was a very abusive man because he brought the war, World War II, back home. And I had received that. So I knew what violence was. And as I was going back across the country thinking about that bayonet and how I did not want to put it into somebody's belly or anywhere else for that matter, I thought, I'm not a Christian, particularly although I did grow up in the church and we sang a lot of songs and I was there and I did preach a few sermons, but I couldn't claim Christianity because I wasn't quite sure if I believed Jesus came from the virgin birth, nor did I think he rose from the dead, so I didn't qualify. And I was living in the South, and of course the South is a place where you have only a certain bit of religion for yourself. It's kind of narrow. I decided to apply for a conscientious objector status. And so that's what I did. I got the Quaker book and I read about it, and I went to the minister of my church and I overcame my hypocrisy of wanting to be a general, and I said, I'm gonna apply as a Methodist. I'm gonna apply as a Christian. And the preacher, sure enough, wrote this great letter. I submitted it to the draft board, and lo and behold, guess what came back? I, I, I got my objector status. I was a conscientious objector, conscientiously opposed to going to fight in Vietnam. I don't know if I was a pacifist or not, but I, I knew that that war was not one I wanted to participate in. Something told me, here we are back to the storyteller. Here we are back to the, the spirits. Something told me, you don't go to that war. So what I decided to do, I went to the preacher and said, well, what could I do for my two years alternate service? And he said, you can go to Wesley Nursing Center in Charlotte, North Carolina and be an orderly. And I did. Wesley Nursing Center was on Shamrock Drive. So I went to Wesley Nursing Center and I put on my little white suit and it was nice and I could get a new white suit every day and I rode a bicycle because I couldn't afford a car because I was only getting paid $1.65 an hour, right? And I was 20 so I could ride a bicycle. Why not? And so every day I would show up and I would do my work and I would go down the, the West Wing and take care of, of Reverend Gibbs or the Man, I don't remember his name, but he, he had no legs because he had diabetes. Ridenauer, Mr. Ridenauer was his name. And at the other end of the hall, in the, in the east side of the hall, was Dr. Hoyle's room. And Dr. Hoyle was this persnickety, 
dentist. And all of the orderlies hated working with Dr. Hoyle because he had this beautiful room. It was the end of his life. He couldn't hear very well and he couldn't see, but you would go in there and it would seem like it was his, his study. And I would often go in and he was upset and he was mad. And he was always upset and he was angry. And I started to notice the reason why it was because none of the orderlies who were assigned to Dr. Hoyle would give him a bath. They would just rub him down like he was an animal and leave him in the chair. And he absolutely hated that. So is there peace in the world? Not in Dr. Hoyle's room, because he was completely, utterly upset and sick because what he wanted was the perfect bath. So I was walking down that hall and I ended up having Dr. Hoyle on my list, you know, you know Dr. Hoyle, got to go give him a bath. And I thought, I'm going to give this guy the best bath that he's ever had in his life. There may not be any peace in the world and I may not like working my conscientious objectors thing, but this guy, I'm going to give him a bath. And the reason why those orderlies, I think, didn't want to give Dr. Hoyle a bath was because he had to get his clothes off. He wanted to be put in a hot tub full of soapy water and you had to scrub him down from head to toe and that included the private parts, which he would let you get almost close to and then he would take the, the rag and say, I'm gonna do my private parts. But everything else you could do, I want you to sit here and help me wash every bit of my toes in between. So I decided to go in there and I don't know how long I would go in but I, I went in the first time and I said, Dr. Hoyle, I'm going to give you a bath. And I said, let's go. And I ran the water, please run it hot. I ran it hot. I filled it full of suds. I said, does this suit you? Let me help you with your clothes. I'll take your clothes off. Old man, not much flesh left, just bones, but he was elegant. And when he sank in that tub, his face glowed like the sun. Is there light? Yes. Dr. Hoyle's face was lit up and I was a boy and I thought, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to scrub every inch of this man until he is so clean, he will think he went to heaven. And I did that. And it took a long time to give Dr. Hoyle his bath. And I was conscientiously opposed to war, but I was conscientiously in favor of a clean Dr. Hoyle. And I rubbed him down and cleaned him and polished him. And then we ran all the water out and I filled the tub back up and sprayed him down until he was completely squeaky, helped him out, patted him down, put on his elegant bathrobe and, and said, let me help you in your chair. Can I get you something to eat? And it was around lunchtime and his lunch would come and he would eat in his chair with his beautiful robe, spotless, clean, smiling, and just as happy as he could be. And I think I may have been happier than Dr. Hoyle. I don't know, but there was peace in the world in Dr. Hoyle's room. And I didn't fight in Vietnam and I never have killed anybody. And I'm grateful to say that both decisions, cleaning Dr. Hoyle and keeping my soul somewhat unsoiled by not going to Vietnam worked out. Happy holidays. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And there you go, my story of traveling to Denver, deciding to become a conscientious objector, returning to Asheville, going to Charlotte, and working at Wesley Nursing Center. The yes, yes, yes you heard at the end of the story was Re Regina Ress, who is a professional storyteller. She worked all over the world telling stories. She was based in New York, and now she lives in Santa Fe. So if you'd like to tell a personal story of your own, here are a couple of tips. One, keep it simple. You can tell the story of what it was like to wake up in the morning, make your tea, make your coffee, do your morning ritual, and settle in for your day. You can put a little drama in it by adding numbers. I woke up at 5.30 a.m. this morning. I put the kettle on, looked out the window, and saw three inches of snow on the ground. I made a cup of coffee, I sat down at my desk, and wrote a page or two in my journal about nothing in particular. So if you do decide to practice telling a personal story, Pick something simple, like getting up in the morning, add some numbers, see where it takes you. I hope you enjoyed what George had to say about building her puppets, and most especially, I hope you 
can take the time to watch Pinocchio on Netflix. Like I said, it's a delightful story about love, loss, grief, transformation, returning to the light. So with that, I'll say thank you ever so much for listening to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVM LP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online wpvmfm.org the voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico thank you Walter Parks for our theme song walterparks.com for more on Walter's music thank you Devin Dial for managing WPVMFM and Robin Collier for managing KCEI out of Taos if you would like to reach out to me Nave at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you would like to improve your writing chops, imaginativestorm.com is a great place to go. I'm recording this show on December the 14th, 2023. Here's a reminder. I'm going to be presenting A Child's Christmas in Wales on Zoom December the 20th at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. If you would like to join me for that gathering, it's about 45 minutes on Zoom. I would love to have you. My door is always open. It's a free event. I do it every Christmas. I recently performed it in Taos, New Mexico, and now I can perform it on Zoom, which means I'm performing it all over. Over the world. So I hope you can join me for that. JamesNave.com is where you will find just below the fold the link to the events page and there you'll find the Zoom link. Or you can email me Nave at JamesNave.com if you would like to have me send you the Zoom link. So on that note, once again, thank you ever so much for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio. I really do appreciate it. And hey, I hope I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.